Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, an inspired conversation space between Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner on the journey of motherhood through the common thread of parenting, relationship and sexuality as a path to consciousness. We keep our conversations honest, our experiences real and our philosophies exploratory. We believe that in order to raise incredible humans, we first have to raise ourselves. We know that in order to rock the family, you've got to nourish the mother. If you are here, you care about paving a path of conscious and intentional motherhood connected with yourself and your gifts, and also illuminating your children in theirs so we may raise more whole humans who can impact this world in a more humane way. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively, head on over to bridgetwood.life or julietenner.love to go deeper. And for all live streamed, pre release podcasts and all our free content, head over to our free Facebook group, Nourishing the Mother with Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. We are Julie Tenner and Bridget Wood, and we are so grateful you're here. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is How Do I Be My Own Anchor in My Perfect Storm? So this comes from, hopefully if you've been a long-time listener, you know that I'm going through a vaginal prolapse and consequently hysterectomy and vaginal repair process and have been going through that for a number of years, but certainly in a more acute accumulation this year. And if you've been a listener this year, you will be on that journey with us. If you haven't, welcome. Well, we <laughs> Here said, we are. Welcome. We said the that. first sentence. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to our space. <laughs> so um, part of this podcast, as you know, this podcast very much aligns with our life. Mm-hmm. So whatever topics are coming up, not only are happening for us, but also are happening for you. And we always know that whatever comes through us or to us from listeners is so relevant for whatever the collective is currently moving through. So we always trust that there's a piece of every podcast that will speak directly to your heart and likewise is equal wisdom and soul medicine for our hearts. So today's podcast, we want to kind of talk about and following on to next week, part of this identity crumbling that happens at peak times in our lives and certainly motherhood journey. Mm. So I'm going, I have my hysterectomy coming up in about two weeks. And this right now, today's day one of the first day of my bleed, that will be the last bleed that I ever have. Mm. So Bridget opened up this call and she said, how are you? And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know. I'm like living in the ocean right now. One minute there's like a wave and I'm like, oh my God, I'm betraying my body. Like, and then next minute I'm like, oh, this is total liberation and freedom. I cannot wait to never have to fucking be here again. And then I'm back to betrayal and then I'm opening up to love. And then like, it's like, <laughs> I think, I think you said, I think I'm too emotional to do this podcast. And I'm like, no, this is perfect because <laughs> this process can be like, we can see this happening in so many pivotal areas of our life, right? Like, you know, when we become mothers and we hold on so fervently to like breastfeeding or we hold on so fervently to like the way that sleep works for our family or, you know, whatever that thing mm. is that that we've that we've come to find our identity in and then it becomes kind of sometimes go, we go through a process of it being crashed, you know, in from all angles, whether that's initiated from inside ourselves or it's like, you know, the outside world challenging us. And yeah. so I felt like, yeah, like, yes, it's your story of, of your hysterectomy, but also I think that it, it, it evokes so much like yeah like that that's me too like in other areas of motherhood and womanhood I hope so so where we're going to center is just obviously with my storytelling of where I currently find myself but please apply this to how it applies to you in your life right now is what we're trying to say because this 
process this experience of meeting the self and identity and shame and self-righteousness and pain and all of the things will happen for each one of us when we're going through this identity crumbling piece. So, you know, here's where I find myself. So feeling like it's a complete liberation and also meeting all of my up until this point in time, identities that have been around. The body is whole, the body is perfect, the body is wisdom. The mind is what the physical body is a representation of. So therefore, if there's something dysfunctional in my physical body, then there's sure as shit something dysfunctional in my mind, in my thinking, in my belief systems, in my perceptions and projections. So, you know, again, so much of not enough, do better, be better, find a way through this, balance it out. If you did this right, you wouldn't experience these things, Mm. right? So this really self-righteous view of alternative and natural medicines and certainly in the world of alternative therapies is often where we can find ourselves. Now, I say that as a practitioner. And I say that as just a human who who loves, adores and adopts that way of living and belonging to the world. Mm. So never in my life did I think I would be here going, actually, what is the greatest liberation for me is to hand my body over Mm. unconsciously to someone else that I'm completely trusting to put their hands and tools inside of my body. And remove it, pieces of it, and patch other pieces of it back together. I never thought I would be that person. Mm. So it's such a journey, fuck me, it's a journey of identity crumbling and um, opening and humility and profound love, like profound love, loving humans and women and people in ways that that I have not opened up to as yet by virtue of of the projections and perceptions that my previous identity has held. Mm. So whenever we open identity, we actually open more love because Mm. we're able to love wider and people see that and so they love us back. So on this journey, I have you know, really opened myself up to everybody's stories, right? I've shared it through a very public podcast that has nearly a million downloads. Mm. I've put it out on social media. I've, you know, gone through the all of the avenues that I can to receive as many stories as I can. So consequently, I've heard a lot. <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories. So which has been incredibly liberating because I have heard stories of hysterectomy and vaginal repair that are my worst nightmare. And I have heard stories of hysterectomy and vaginal repair that are someone's best life decision they ever made, the most liberating, empowering moment of their life. Mm -hmm. So it has been so wonderful to just open myself up continuously as a practice as I listen to each one of these stories to love this woman, to love her story, to not jump into out of the story and into judging it and holding it and dissecting it as a way to to emotionally remove myself and mentally, I don't know, hook myself in some way. Yeah. So I have then this huge body of stories and quite ironically, I was having a conversation with my mother-in-law the other day who shared with, with me when she was 40, she had a hysterectomy and I didn't know this. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I mean, it was just, she's so magically stoic, which I've always judged. And yet as I've grown older, have completely grown to see the wisdom and I can adore it. You know, sometimes I giggle at it, but I can adore it. Mm -hmm. So here she goes, no, best thing I ever did. Best thing that I ever did. Love, like changed my life. She said, you know, I spent And she said, we didn't know as much back then either, but she said, I was hideously sick with my period. I'd been in bed for days, migraines and suffering. I had endometriosis. I had multiple cysts on my ovaries, like a hideous suffering every single month. And then someone said to me, you don't have to suffer like that anymore. Do you Mm -hmm. want me to help you? I said, yes, I do. And she had this hysterectomy and she never again had a migraine, never again got sick, never again entered this 
quite debilitating experience of her life. So for her, best decision she ever made. The ultimate liberation. Like so handing oh. over her body. Yes. Yeah, unconscious. Like, yes. like what you talked through, right? Yes. yes. It was actually liberating and empowering. Yes. And she even she even recalled to me, she goes, oh, you know, there was these women that would come up to me and say, oh, but your womb, like you've just, aren't you sad? Like you've just lost like the piece of you that makes you a woman. And she was like, I turned around to them and she almost had like this kind of spish, spish kind of, you know, slap of the cheek kind of way tone in her voice. And she was like, I went, uh, no, because you wouldn't even know looking at me. I look exactly the same. I'm still a woman. I am a woman that looks exactly the same. You wouldn't know. So no, I don't feel like that at all. It's incredibly liberating. Please leave my space. <laughs> How she and I was just like, this is fantastic to listen to. So I've got this, right? So loads of support, loads of, okay, I can totally see the journey that you have been on. I watch myself put forward first as an identity piece to protect myself. You know, I've done all of the things. I've been all the places. I've been on this journey for, you know, really consciously for six years. I've done this. 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 And nothing's worked. So now I'm here. And so now my option is surgery. I watch myself want to do that mm-hmm. or sometimes start that or sometimes even finish it and then go why why do you need to justify mm-hmm. your decision why do you need to put up front you know I'm, I'm making this choice but only because I need you to know that I'm really empowered and I've done all of the things and and what yeah you know yeah. Yeah, who are you perceiving that judgment from that you haven't like done enough? Right, exactly. Or, 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 or that this might be your, like, you know, what's wrong if this was your first choice? Right. This is exactly. So this is kind of painting the picture for exactly where I am right now. And so because I've witnessed that in myself, I've been really asking myself to 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 focus on that piece of identity because the truth is you haven't done it all, Julie, because it all will never end. Yeah. There will always be. Someone who's seen this, someone whose therapy that works, someone who knows this practitioner. So like there will always be that. Mm. So can I sit here and say I've done it all? No, I can't. So stop. Yeah. So I'm really like piece by piece as I'm noticing my protective strategies, trying just to unfurl them Mm. a little bit further. And liberate myself a little more by by balancing out the stories because the stories of, you know, alternative circles are very comfortable for me. I can easily, like teeth, re- return to that way, right? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to work out how do I broaden my perspective and listen to other choices and liberations and experiences. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I'm organising my rite of passage and for the first time I'm also doing it completely differently to the way that I have ever in my life done ceremony before and let me just say that not lightly because that's a shit ton of ceremony over a shit ton of years (laughs) and never in my life have I would I have thought that this is where I would be and that this is how I would choose to play because I'm choosing to play with my fear and laugh till I cry with my fear rather than trying to enter it the other way because I've always done it the other way so I'm having this experience and I've invited my friends and I have one friend who I sent this message same message to everyone I went back yeah I'm so excited can't wait love to be there except for this one beautiful friend who I love with my whole heart who wrote back how heartbroken she was about this decision and that she was in tears and she was crying for my womb and she was trying to think of a thousand ways that this didn't have to happen And I was like, oh, flooded with this, just I totally get where she's at and I don't judge her at all because 100% that has been me. I totally get it. I totally get it. I said to Nick, I totally get it. This was exactly who I was when a text message or whatever would come through with a friend who's just had a Caesar and I'd be like, oh, shame. Yeah. Another one's bitten the dust. Like, ugh, makes my skin crawl even when I say that now. But I can feel my younger self there. Mm. And I know that's where she's at, only for her. This is this is my Caesar and this is for her where she's at going. But 
you like you how could you how could you I just mourn your womb and and the persecution of women and wombs throughout history Mm. so I said to this beautiful friend look I really want to have a conversation with you because I love you I love you I love you I love you I do not feel judged but I also can't have you at my circle if this is where you're at because this isn't what my rite of passage needs it needs the energy of like celebration and reflection and like you know yeah acceptance and and all of that behind you yeah yeah so I was thinking today it's a lot like organizing a funeral like because I so see a rite of passage as a death so it's an honoring of a death so that there may be an opening for new life Mm -hmm. and there's funerals that we've been to that you know are just heart crushingly full of sorrow and longing for the life that was and it leaves like a hollow at the center Mm. and there's funerals that I have gone to that are full of love and life and celebration and gratitude and appreciation for what was Mm. and what has been and what will be Mm. and that's the type of funeral that I'm creating for my womb Mm. so if you're at the other funeral you just can't be at mine (laughs) (laughs) so I met up with this beautiful friend and we talked it out and we talked it out and um anyway so I don't need to go into that any further where I want to get to is where where we where I'm trying to pull this round to Bridget is our podcast (laughs) which is noticing yourself in the shame stumble of identity crisis because that's certainly where I see myself right now because this beautiful friend is holding up the most perfect mirror Mm. for all of the belief systems and identities that I have been up until this point in time. Mm. So when I'm talking to her, I'm talking to the me that was Mm. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, one year ago, right? So every time she's speaking to me, I'm having a conversation with myself. Which acts almost like a, you know, a challenger to say, like, are you sure? Like, are you sure you're ready to like walk, you know, carry yourself across this threshold that you can't come back from? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the way, where we wanted to go was really, if you find yourself here and you're making choices that you never thought you would, or choices that feel in opposition to who you've been up until this point, or choices that feel oppositional to the people around you and the circles that you run in, is just to notice when you're doing this stumble of, oh God, crushing in on the self, mm. past or future. Oh God, I can't believe I thought that way or saw life that way. Mm. Oh God, I'm not sure that, that, you know, she's the person that does, you know, that. And, and can I love her like this, this shame crumble. Yeah. So we just want you to be aware that that's something that can happen. Mm. And if it's loving your past self that you're struggling with, then the invitation is, how is to open up and consider how did that past self really serve you Mm. how did how was her belief systems and the path that that took you on total love for your mission and your purpose and your self-discovery and like how is and was that such perfect love Mm. without needing to hold on to it yeah like because this can be so common right like for us to almost like this idea of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like once once we let go of an identity or once we see ourselves as having transitioned from something, there can be this sense of like discarding that past self mm. but not seeing the beautiful perfection of how that orchestration of beliefs and meaning led to like, you know, this tapestry of interconnectedness to who you are now. Yes. Brought in the relationship so meaningful to you that allowed you to focus on the things that helped you develop mastery in what was meaningful to you. And, you know, when you can see that picture in its totality, you you have a sense of grace for that identity Mm. and a sense of integration of it, not this, you know, like shrinking in the face of it or like wanting to bury it. 
So perfect because you don't want to shrink or bury. You just want to be able to tuck her under your wing and go, yeah, that was love and this is love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfectly said. Just a brief break to the podcast to let you know what's happening in our world. So in Bridgetwood.life, you will find Reimagining Motherhood, which is a beautiful membership space where you can come into and really be held and seen in community of other women who are really seeking to expand themselves in motherhood and really be at that intersection of where conscious parenting and the whole woman collide. So it's not either or it is this beautiful melting pot of the two so that you can really dig deep and expand who you are on this mothering journey and what about you Jules is queen school so queen school is now a online course with four full modules that you are self-paced and work your way through combined with 12 months of really stretching that out as i help you really integrate embody and move through the blocks so that you can literally become queen school in your life so queen school is all about connection pleasure sensuality magnetic communication feminine energy and embodiment with me over and now a beautifully integrated 12-month experience. So you can find out more at julietenner.love. And if it's your future self, that it's really worth opening up and going, what are the possibilities this future self has that you don't currently experience? Mm. What are the ways that this could go? So I'm trying to help myself out on that journey by listening to the many stories because I don't want to get so pumped up that I only listen to the good ones. Yeah. Because I want to equilibrate that this is a choice that could go either way. And if it's a real choice with integrity, I am willing to walk that path of risk and reward. Mm. So you want to make sure that you're balancing that where it gets dangerous is where you're like, well, this will solve my life and all of my problems from henceforth. This will be the cure all. That's where it's dangerous. That's right. You have this fantasy that then, you know, has to has to create a nightmare to humble you. Balance. Exactly. Exactly. So you want to hear both, but at the same time, open up the possibilities, which Bridgie, you were so excellent at with me. I was reflecting on when I was pregnant with my fourth and was absolutely in shock mode and was like, my life is over. I can't do this. And you were like, but you know, what about this? Yeah. But what if it grows your abundance? Yeah. But it could change and grow your life and change and grow here and change and grow. And you just constantly offered me just that stretch beyond where my thinking was because you because you I mean for you I know because you had this really like hooked in family pattern right of poverty and like the fourth mm. child meaning poverty and the fourth child meaning like the end of your dreams or the end of a woman's yeah dreams, right yes. whereas I was like I have so many examples of like amazing entrepreneurial women with four children like that was all that was coming into my head and I was like no no like I think this is going to be amazing <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So my point is here to do that. And if you can't do it for yourself, find a champion like a bestie who can just help you go, oh, or like my mother-in-law, this is the best decision that ever happened for me. It changed my life in these ways. It grew my life in these ways. These things that I thought were not possible for me actually really are. Mm. So just to bring yourself out of that shame crumble, if that's where you find yourself on this identity kind of tightrope walking. Then the second part that we want to talk to you about is that in a dynamic where you're going through an identity shift, as we were just going to tap back into it, is 100%, there will be someone around you, probably someone you love, who will take on the role of being your mirror for past self-beliefs, identities, and almost like the last little, you know, dangling of the carrot you sure you're ready to let this go? Like it's the last challenge, right? Whenever we become someone new, there's always this last challenge. Mm. Or, and or if you want to look at them as the challenger, the person who will always offer you the equilibration Mm. and the degree to which you hold on to and attach to one way will be the degree and that it's right and only possibility will be the degree that the challenger brings challenge, right? Yeah. Yeah. So my mirror and challenger and my beautiful friend actually comes with a whole lot of big breasted heart hugging love. Mm. But that I think is also reflective of just enough sting 
but not so much that I need to fight or defend because I'm doing my self equilibration. So equilibrate self or the world equilibrates you, right? So the degree of challenge is also representative of your degree of polarization or infatuation. Mm. But know that that person is purposeful, right? Like they're there to help you. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just such a beautiful reminder and a way to see that person playing that role as as someone that you can love. And even for them taking that, and even to the point where like you wouldn't want them to support you the way that you think you want, yes. right? Because, you know, even for you, like going into that conversation, I'm sure part of you really wanted her to turn around and, and agree with you and support oh, you. Oh, yeah, of course. Right? Right. <laughs> Like how much do we want support? We crave yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And but yet actually you can love her more in many ways because of the role she's playing. Because yeah. she exists as a perfect balance to everything else that everyone else that's around you that's saying, Yeah, sure, like just choose it, like go for it. It's like so liberating. Do it. Yeah. She's there going from your heart, like from your, you know, the heart that you've come to know about who you are, she's like, are you sure? Like what about the echoes of the feminine, yeah. you know, that you're, that you're now yeah. like questioning or like challenging, yeah. letting go of? Yeah, my ethos on the body and mm. my self-identity around have I done enough yeah. or really am I a quitter? Have mm-hmm. I worked hard enough to earn this, you know, badge out or am I a quitter? Yeah. You know, like so many of my, it's just my past self just like coming up and coming up and coming up, yeah. you know. And how beautifully delivered in a form yes, a person that you can't look away from. No, and, and don't, don't want to either. No, and I mean, and this is why I also think like, more broadly with considering other contexts is how often mother-in-laws can be the perfect package of that challenger yes. because it's not somebody often we can easily escape and it's somebody who we know has a powerful role to play. It's true. And it's a powerful imprint. And so it's true. It's, 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 they're in your, in your vicinity, they're in your space and you cast them in the role that they're cast in for some kind of purpose. Yeah. Yeah. So we just really want you to see this person as a love. I would love you to see it as I'm having conversations with myself. Mm. So how can I meet that with that same level of respect and softness Mm. and love how wide can I love? Because, you know, as Bridget and I were talking about before this podcast, this for me was a real invitation yet again into really how good are you at loving? Mm. Because you're not that good at loving if you go, I can only love you and you are only lovable when. Yeah. You do this set of things and you play by this set of rules that are what I like. Mm. And when I don't like the set of rules and the way that you are that you play by, I no longer wish to love you. Mm. that's not and I'll withdraw that love and connection yes Mm. and punish you for that Mm. that's not love so I'm always on this path of of devotional love I am always asking myself I'm here to pray at the altar of love in this lifetime so yet again how do I love more how do I open again how do I stretch this chest and sometimes feel like I'm cleaving it open to make space because there is space. Mm. It's only my self-protection and my identity that that wants to claw it closed and mm. sew it up and push you away. Yeah. So it is a little bit of a spirit ego battle. Mm. How do I love you and love this moment and hold myself that I can? That's why we called this podcast, How Do I Be My Own Anchor in My Own Perfect Storm? Because this challenger will offer you your perfect storm, Mm -hmm. perfectly individually tailored to exactly your wounds, exactly your values, exactly your past identities. It is your perfect storm. So here you go. Can you hold yourself in who you are with authenticity and integrity Mm. at the same time? as love for self and love for other. Like, can you do that? Mm. 
because that for me is the practice. If I can do that, I'm ready to walk through to my new identity. I'm ready to claim it. Mm -hmm. But this is like that last, you know, when in any fairy tale worth its salt, there's always that last challenge where Mm -hmm. the hero or heroine is either going to die or win. Yeah. There's always that moment in a rite of passage. And so then you would never want to not have that challenger because that challenger makes you ready for that rite of passage. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. So I just love the idea of how do we hold the self and love more and at the same time listen deeply to what they're saying and hear the pain points, like let yourself feel the pain and then take each one of those pangs and go, okay, where am I really at with that? How do I want to untangle that? Mm. How do I sit with that? How do I really, how do I claim more? How do I, like just each one of those pangs, it only pangs because there's a truth, there's an attachment, there's a hook still in there. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't pang. Mm. So it's also such a beautiful way to, to sit in that. Now, also, I'm very lucky, I think, in this circumstance that I surround myself with people with deep integrity and this beautiful woman sat in front of me and said, my love, I can hold you in your stuff while I'm a little bit at sea in what this has brought up for me and my own projections. Yeah. I can do, I can do both. I can dance both. Mm. And I thought, yeah, that's relationship, right? Yeah. Which brings me to this last point, which is whenever we go through this, <laughs> we're feeling a little bit wobbly. We will seek certainty from the person that's our closest caregiver, mm. right? The, yeah. the person who represents our codependence. That for me is my husband. So, you know, I picked one of these threads apart that I've been pulling apart today, which is the betrayal of my own body. Is this a liberation or is this a betrayal? Mm -hmm. And how do I feel about betraying my physical body? And so I've been really like moving through that today. And my husband got home and, you know, how are you? And I sort of, you know, gave him the background story on my first day of my last bleed and, you know, where I was at. And then I sort of pensively, you know, dropped my tone and said, I'm really sitting with the betrayal. Do you think I am betraying my body by cutting my womb out? You know, I left it like this. And if I was sitting with you, Bridget, or with my other beautiful friend, you and I would probably chew this around and macerate in it. And like, really, I would feel (laughs) so like we'd gone there. And he like looked at me and went, no. And then off he went. (laughs) And I was like, I'm sorry, what? What? (laughs) I just bared like, you know, the depths of my vulnerable heart and body with you. And you just said, nah. (laughs) I literally... And I sat there for a bit and I let it linger and I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> well, I was really hoping for something different there. And, you know, he definitely didn't deliver on that. And I'm going through, right, okay. We have different value systems. And I'm like, Bagman, are you sure I'm not betraying my body? Like, are you really sure? Mm. He's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, right. Okay. So, and it kind of, I felt dissatisfied. There's a little bit of, you know, saltiness from this conversation, which I thought would happen to so many of us when we're in these vulnerable states, unless we're consciously aware of our projections, Mm. of our protective strategies, our personal ones, and of our partner's values, that could cause a major rift. It could because it does that whole thing where, like, you don't see me. I can't be my whole self with you. I can't be vulnerable. Like, I can think of so many times, like, even, like, I remember um, a time when I was really, like, grieving not being able to have another baby. Like, I was going through that secondary infertility thing and mm. I was so emotional at one point seeing, like, my husband, sorry, seeing on Facebook, some, yet, yet another person had had another baby. And I was, like, really, like, sad about it. And my husband's like, it's going to happen for us. It's like not a big deal. Like it was just not not a big deal for him because he just had this certainty that's like, that's going to happen. Don't stress. Whereas I'm like, but is it really? (laughs) (laughs) Same thing. Like, it's the same thing. Like, I don't know. 
I feel this gaping sense of loss right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he was just like back to his whatever he was reading. Like, yeah, he's like, no, done deal. Yep. How's the certainty though? Right. Yeah. Like you got to admire it because it's totally makes it like totally the same. No, yeah. I'm very black. It's very clear. It's so masculine, black and white. No. But what what the feminine perceives that as as like rejection, mm. as like not not being seen or valued or heard, mm. Mm. you know, and, and that can feel like we immediately then want to close up yeah. because like I've tried to open the you know like the flower of my heart and soul, yeah. and you have just <laughs> stamped on it. So true. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> so yeah so what we're leading you to um is like seeing this as like hey like well how is this pushback actually you know a reflection of different values for example of us projecting our like thing that we're building up and having this story around and have an agenda and attachment to them having the same story right (laughs) and then it's like bursting your bubble bursting your story you know, kind of like pushing you back into yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, when you, t- you touched on this idea of like well, that, the, the truth of that, like, you know, our codependencies, how does that serve also as a as a tool for individuation? So you're not losing yourself in him and his support because he's not giving you any support. No. Because this is for you to journey on your own. Right. It's not about him. Right. About what he thinks about your body. With yeah body. it's yours to right <laughs> <laughs> but here I am going just take away a little bit of the pain and discomfort and just you know I'll just outsource some of that because if you tell me that I'm good mm. you know like just yes 100% feeling exactly what you're saying yeah yeah I think it's, it's echoes of our inner child in that right like of like totally. that, like it'll be okay sweetie yeah you know, like yeah it's okay we're gonna do this together yeah. Like you know, wanting that person to play that role of almost in some ways, like parenting you through the hard bit. Totally want to be parented through it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we really hope that this podcast perhaps just frames for you with some context that allows you to anchor in and ground into the experience that you're having. Because often when we understand it from a slightly wider lens, slightly bigger perspective that is both meaningful and purposeful it can make it easier to journey the thing that feels hard it can actually build your capacity and give you more certainty on a process when you can understand it as such so we hope that you feel you know just that sense of camaraderie that we have been where you are we will return to where you are I'm there right now girlfriend yeah And that it's okay to do this identity crisis thing at the same time as motherhood and life and demand. And like just being a human is hard and that's okay. And that you perhaps have some context to be able to move through that in a slightly more seamless way. And I hope with stronger relationships and a greater capacity to love. And I think too, with an identity crisis like this, that there's, it's such a dance that you don't, really get to like the full body yes and that you're not necessarily meant to there's parts of you that are going to have like one foot in this future self and one foot kind of where you've been and like that that dance is is part of your rite of passage it doesn't mean that it's a wrong yeah totally yeah like we have danced so many times before Mm. yeah when you went from child to maiden when you went from maiden to long-term relationship or marriage when you went from you know pregnant to being a mother you know like there's so many of those foot in each camp without certainty and taking that leap just trusting the one next step that's in front of you but not knowing with certainty what happens next so if you find yourself there feeling you and also hope that you gain something really beautiful as a little gem to help you on your way yes so what's going on in your world Jules it is the Queen School Honey Club journey which is where you trust me to guide you through 12 months of effortless integration for feminine and masculine principles within your life yourself your love and your body and you can find out about that at julietenner.love and you Bridgie 
Yes, is reimagining motherhood. So it's the space where conscious parenting and the whole woman collide to empower you in motherhood. And this next couple of months, we're looking at all things embodying spaciousness, which you know does integrate a lot of what we've talked about in this episode, but also bringing down some body practices and just a really supportive toolkit to help you bring more of that into your motherhood because many of us need it. So find out more about that at bridgetwood.life. Remember tonight, it's woman to rock the family. And we'll see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey. Thank you so much for listening. We literally couldn't do this without you. Please share this podcast with anyone you think it would be medicine for. If you desire to integrate your learnings practically and supportively into your life, then head on over to bridgetwood.life or julietenner.love to go deeper. And if you feel like giving back a little to this free content, please rate us on iTunes or Facebook, all of which helps the podcast reach more mamas who need this type of tonic for the soul.